Welcome to How to Deal in the Shit Gets Real podcast. I'm Marietta. And I'm Connie. And today we are here with John Eli. Uh, so, John, how do you deal when shit gets real? Or just tell I our guess, listeners a little bit about yourself. I, I love how you guys jump right into radio style voices the second we jump into this. It's, it's great. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is John. Uh, I, I am an ex HF baseball player. I went to school with Rietta and uh, we've been friends for a long time. So we are going to dive into this, this, uh, this interview podcast, whatever, with the best uh, answers I could possibly give the questions and uh, hopefully I can give some insight into my journey as a professional. Awesome. Well, I guess the first question would be, what started your love of baseball? Uh, honestly, so great question. Rita had sent me these uh, this email with uh, several questions on it, and I, I read them over, and I couldn't. I, I I really enjoyed the questions as I read them, and when I really started thinking about how I, I created my love for baseball, it was it was more it was more so the. Um, community feeling that I felt like I guess community friendship that I had with my my peers at that age level it was more so me fitting in and I enjoyed the interaction that I had with my friends at the time so that, that's all it was it, that's how I created a love for baseball and it could have been basketball it could have been could have been football it could have been anything right but it just happened to be baseball at the time that's and because it was that specifically that's how I created my love for it because it was year to year we just played the same sport right so at a very young age, I want to say I started playing at five or six or something like that. It was just kind of a product of my environment. It, it just became a year to year thing. Okay. We're going to go out for baseball this year. Here's tryouts. Here's everything that and you create a love for the sport through the people you hang around and just kind of built from there. I, I suppose uh, if that's, that's the best answer I can, I, I can give for how it started. Uh, I created a better love for it once um, we progressed throughout the years and became more in depth with what uh, the sport became getting into high school and college and everything else. But that's a longer story. <laughs> so, but uh, it honestly, it was a product of the environment I was in and just happened to be the sport I was playing at the time. Did you always want to be a pitcher or was that something that just kind of came about? Just turned out I was, I was decent at it. That was the best, my best <laughs> position. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I was, uh, I was okay coming up in high school. I know already you saw me play, but I was always a pitcher. Uh, I just, I was, I was the best at that at, at, at the time I could have, I played to several other positions, but in, in high school, but I, the best arm at that point in time. And that's why I stuck to the position. So once I, I went to college, I went from a multi-positional player in high school to a pitcher only we call it PO. It's, that's kind of what you say when, when you become a pitcher. It's uh, your PO, you're a pitcher only, right? Uh, that's what happens when, when you go to college or when you get drafted. That's the transition, right? So when everybody realizes, okay, well, this is going to be what you do best, that's, that's what you stick to. And that's what happened to me. You were always a very good pitcher. I definitely remember. It's just, you know, some certain things to stick in your mind. I'm, I remember seeing... Drew Brees, when I went to, when he was playing college and it just, when you see somebody who's a good player, it just kind of sticks in your mind for whatever reason. I remember it was the same thing when I saw Drew, I'm like, dude, he's going to be legit. And it was kind of the same thing. Yes. Well, I appreciate it. God, you put me in the same freaking category as Drew Brees. God, <laughs> <laughs> not quite that. It's never quite that good, but yeah, no, it's, it, uh, I, I, God bless Rietta. You held me on a pretty high pedestal. I appreciate that. Yeah. It, it, no, I, it, there was there was always a separation there, and I, and I, I appreciate you recognizing that. But uh, I I thought I was good enough to play in multiple positions, but uh, in reality, pitching pitching was always going to be what I was going to do, especially once I had to college. So that's kind of what what worked out for me. So did that like specialization make you love the game more or less? I was specialized late in my career. And I believe that's probably the smartest thing. I don't think anybody should be specialized until at least college because it's not smart. Everybody should be, should be able to do everything unless, uh, unless they can't, but um, 
my personal preference is as far as uh, from a coaching standpoint is that it's irresponsible to specialize before you get to college. It, it, you know, from a positional standpoint in any sport, I think you should play everything until you get to college because it makes you a better overall athlete, a better overall you know, at any, anything you do, to be honest with you. No, that makes sense. Cause then you're also, you won't get bored of it either. You learn different movement patterns and everything that you would not have learned if you were only repeating one thing from high school on. Right. So yeah. you become more of an overall and well-rounded player no matter what. So if I'm a pitcher now, all of a sudden I'm able to do other things. I'm able to feel my position. I'm able to be more of an athlete. I'm, I'm just better at my craft because I wasn't just typecast to doing one stationary and one repeated movement pattern for my entire life, which I think is a travesty that high school kids are put into a position where they're, Oh, you're going to be a pitcher or you're going to be this. Like, no, I encourage as much different, different activity as you possibly can get throughout your entire youth. No, I definitely agree too. Cause <laughs> I know when we were in high school, you know, I played multiple different sports or I didn't play one sport all year. And now you're seeing a lot of kids that are playing sports all year and the injuries have really increased. So I definitely yes, see why that is something that you recommend. Cause it makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it, it's just, I mean, then you, you get, there's a lot of added pressure on like, this is what I'm supposed to be, you know, I don't think that's healthy <laughs> for a, from, from a mental standpoint, but also a physical standpoint. Um, if you're not able to do other things, then how are you possibly, you know, held, held accountable for being able to adapt? It's not realistic as all. So you made it to the majors, <laughs> you know, the big dream of anybody who's ever played sports. Play sports. Yeah, majors. exactly. <laughs> what was it like that first time you walked out onto a major league mound? The best way I can describe it is when you're, you're growing up and you have this image built in your mind, right, of how incredible it's going to be. Multiply that by 100 and you're not quite there. <laughs> I always thought I was well when I walked out I was like oh this, this is gonna be great I, I'm no I'm for sure gonna know how to handle this yeah and you look up and the, and the the stands they look like they go on for forever it's like a dream you know like it, it, as much as you prepare yourself you can't possibly possibly prepare yourself enough and uh it's more surreal than you can ever imagine and that's coming from somebody that tries to ground themselves as much as they possibly can. I was overwhelmed. It's, it's incredible. It's if, if you can't, if you can't get excited for something like that, you don't have a heartbeat. It's, <laughs> it, was, it was, it was amazing. It was more than I could have ever imagined. And I imagined quite a bit. So it was, it was incredible. That's the best way I can put it is it was well, well beyond what I could ever imagined. It was incredible. So seeing all those people in the stand, you know, on your first time out in the major leagues, did you have any like stage fright or anything? Or were you just um, like, this is awesome. Let's do this. <laughs> honestly, um, that, well, that's funny because a lot of people have asked me that. I, I say no, because once, as soon as the whistle blows, I mean, obviously there's no whistle in baseball, but luckily my preparation was good. Right. So um, I owe every, everything, I owe all my success to the preparation that I had. Because as soon as I stepped out onto the mound, it was, okay, cool. Hey, it's, it's business as usual. The, the second that you jump into your craft that you've been doing since you were 10 years old, nine, eight years old, all of a sudden it becomes, okay, knee-jerk reaction. Now I'm doing what I've always been doing. Mm -hmm. There's a little added um, nervousness to it. All of a sudden, then you realize that you're good enough to be there and you just fall into a, a routine. And if your routine isn't, you know, rooted in, in very good preparation, you probably don't succeed. And, but at the same time, does that make sense? I, I mean, yeah. I, I hope that. I, mean, I, I don't know if, if that statement makes sense, but um, it, it's overwhelming if, if you're not ready. And mm -hmm. luckily, luckily for me, I was ready because of uh, the situations I was put in prior. You immediately snap into your level of preparation as opposed to your in your mind's eye, what you believe you're going to be. I'm pretty sure I would have peed my pants. 
You see, I, I, I'm trying to say the right thing, but at the same time, yeah, you almost pee your pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then to go from that to seeing your face on the cover of Sports Illustrated, I mean, Jesus. Yeah, that's surreal. It's um, a, a lot of a lot of things have to go right for and things that they disappear just as quickly though. So it's a situation where you, I guess at that age, I didn't really, I, you don't know how to handle it. You're just going about your business and, and you get caught up with it really quick. A lot of people change really fast. I'm luckily for me, I did, I had the right family and friends where I, okay, cool. This is, this is just a part another part of my life. But at the same time, a lot of people get caught up in that kind of shit. So it, it was to say the least surreal. It's hard to believe that somebody can look at you and, and idolize you and then go out in public, everybody's screaming at you and following you around and asking for your autograph. When, Reddy, you know, like we, you and I walked to freaking from from north to south building together from time to time. You know, it's like, <laughs> you, know I mean? you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's, it's, you remember, like, fuck, I'm, I'm not important, you know, like, it, but mm-hmm. people think you are. So it's finding a way to ground yourself is very difficult at that point in time. Um, and a lot of people have a diff- of, they're not able to do it yeah i was very fortunate to have the right family and friends so it didn't really phase me as much as others i just uh it, you, you still do listen to what people tell you and what you think you're supposed to be after that happens it, it's kind of sucks to be honest with you you put a lot more pressure on yourself than you need to but you know you, you handle it everybody handles it in certain ways and some people change some people don't you know I was fortunate enough to say I didn't change. So. You didn't let it go to your head. Well, that's good. Yeah, I, I, I feel bad for people that do. You know, nobody's that fucking different. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, do you like still get like, oh, people asking for like your autographs and stuff, and coming up to you? Is it weird? Do you like it? Very, very Tell me about in, it. <laughs> very, no, very far and few between. Because I'll tell you what. The funniest thing is that uh, you get forgot about faster than you are a person, right? Like the second you're you're somebody, you get forgot about even even quicker. So As the next uh, news story comes along. I'll never forget the story. I was just called up, and it was after I had a couple of good starts, and I was flying from LA to Arizona, and I wasn't even supposed to be on the roster at the time. It was supposed to be kind of like a a secret. Right. So I was on the team, but I wasn't. But I, I showed up to LAX and the security guard goes, oh, my God, you're John Eli. No, hold on. And there was a fucking three mile line. And he goes, here, let me push you right in front. I was like, dude, I like three hours into my flight. I don't need to be in front of the line. He goes, no, no, come with me. Puts me in an elevator. <laughs> 65 people here that need to be in, in, in front of this line more than I do. But he puts me in front. I was like, all right, man, that's fine. I guess, shit, I mean, two years later, the same fucking guy probably wouldn't bend over backwards to get me a, 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 a bottle of water. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> that's how quickly it happens. Um, that's why people, people change the way they do. So I was a very, very, very minute celebrity at one point. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was very, very fleeting. That small piece of the pie made me realize how fucking difficult it is and how much it's absolutely insignificant at the same time it's it's not a big deal nobody nobody at that level actually just serves half the fucking credit they get. <laughs> that makes any sense well now you got to talk about eli mania because we have to hear all about it i mean what it was like <laughs> like i know you kind of touched on it a little bit but you know oh it was it was awesome like you know the people are like shit i almost had a fucking bobblehead it was it was really it was really cool. <laughs> oh that's awesome <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun it, it, it was a lot of fun i mean like the, like people people were screaming my name in public and you know like, like people buy me drinks at, at, at bars and things like that it was, it was awesome i just I, it was it was so weird though you know like imagine all of a sudden you you say this podcast was fucking crazy and everybody's like oh Rihanna. Rihanna's crossing her fingers i'm just yeah, saying yeah, <laughs> Oh my God, it's Rietta and Connie. Like it's it's Connie Rietta Mania, you know. Yeah. It's, it's 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 weird, right? Like all that's this, what I like, would be doing. Yeah, exactly. And you try to be nice to everybody, so it's mm-hmm. and and the thing is, it's, it's very easy to be nice to everybody. It's just also difficult to understand why people think you're that important. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. 
So how did it start? Were you just, you got pulled up to the majors and you started pitching. Did you just start having some good games? Like tell everybody how that all just started. So I had about 13 really quality starts in a row and we were in last place at the time. Over the course of those 13 starts, we went from last to first. And which is why I got so much credit because I, at the time, Kershaw, Clayton Kershaw was become, going from a prospect to a superstar who is now a first ballot Hall of Famer. And yeah. at the time, everybody told me that I was better than him. Well, that wasn't ever true. <laughs> I just, I was getting the credit for it because at the time I was pushing the competitive atmosphere. And that's why Eli Manning was created is because I was very enthused and extremely motivated Without the same talent they, these guys had, I, I really just wanted to be the best, right? So that made me really good at the time, which kind of drives the point that, I mean, I guess motivation means more than anything, right? So <laughs> I wanted it more than anyone, so I created it, and it became a national stage at, the, at, at that point in time. And I got a lot of credit for it because it's a big fan base. It's a national fan base. and. Yeah. Uh, when we went through it, like I got all the credit for it. And it was it was really cool at the time. Honest God. Like uh I loved it, but I just didn't understand why it was happening because I was I was 23 years old. You know, like how the hell are you supposed to quantify a fan base of 30 million people screaming Eli Mania, right? It's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah, no, I, I still awesome. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. No, it, was, it was a lot of fun, but it was fleeting. A lot of fun at the time, but now it's kind of uh, uh, kind of like dust in the wind, right? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> remembers it before. It's, no, uh, no, I don't we, we, we all do. I, I, I'm not ever forgetting my like my family and friends, <laughs> my wife, and everything. We'll never forget that. But it, so it's something that'll always stick with me. But so it, it was amazing at the time. Yeah. Uh, my dad kind of remembered it um, because he's a huge baseball fan, like huge, huge awesome. he loves baseball. And um, I had sent him the picture. I was like, I'm, I'm interviewing my friend from high school. And he's like, I remember when that was happening. He's like, you know him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. I, I'm glad people do remember because it, it really did. It, mean, it meant a lot to me at the time. It still does. It's, it's cool to hear that people remember it, but it was funny to deal with because it, it didn't seem real at the time, you know, and uh, I understand it now, but uh things like that it happened so fast and all of a sudden it was it was over and now here we are and i'm, I'm coaching you know what i mean like so i mean coaching crazy. is still awesome and you're doing yeah. is it the is it the minor league team for the socks yes yeah. that- yeah. uh a single a low a baseball with the white Sox. so that's awesome love, love the white socks first Sox. of all you're on the right team now yeah and clearly damn right we are <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, i love it yeah. yeah and second of all you can be back home like with your friends and family, like you're not, you're not yeah. all the way out in LA, you know? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's a big part of it. I, I always come back and I'm in Chicago for the off season, no matter what. And uh, my wife and I just bought a house in Lombard actually. So we're, uh, oh, nice. yeah, absolutely. We're looking forward to getting settled in there, but you know, it, it's, it's been, a, it's been actually more rewarding to work with the, uh, the younger guys that have a chance to get to the point where I was and just kind of sharing my experiences like, like we are right now is a huge part of development for other people that may eventually get there. Yeah, absolutely. And it's actually been better than playing to be honest with you. <laughs> less pressure. No, well, yeah, less pressure. Plus, I mean, it's, you impact a lot more people. Mm-hmm. So what advice would you give to people who want to be in the majors, like the people you're coaching right now? Maybe they'll listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, I would say just pay attention. That's the best advice I give anybody in any aspect. Just pay attention, think before you act, start to quantify what you do before you do it. It's, it's, it's uh, pay, paying attention is the biggest part of any aspect. Okay, it sounds very simple. Paying attention and taking accountability for your actions. That's the best two piece of advice I could possibly give. It is. People don't realize that it's it's yeah, hard no, to be like, yeah, it was me. I, I fucked up. Sorry. Especially when you're in professional sports. Like from day to day, everybody has an excuse for everything, right? So mm-hmm. when when you're when you're getting paid to do a, like a like a fucking game for a living, 
a lot of time people have a distorted self image, right? So mm-hmm. being able to take accountability for what you do and, and how you act, it's so difficult. That's like what got me into the major leagues, being, like, take, being able to take a step back and say, oh, you know what? I need to be able to get better at this, this, and this. Instead of saying, you know what? If this guy did this or this guy did this, you know, no, no, it's on you. Honest to God, I would say taking accountability for everything you do and paying attention to sh- the shit that happens around you will make you not only better at your job, but a better fucking person. Like, am I wrong about that? Like, no, if, not at all. If, if I, I, I would say that if I was a greeter at Walmart, you know, <laughs> like if, like you could be better at everything by just paying attention and taking accountability for your actions. That's that's the best possible advice I can give. That is good advice. Because paying attention and like accountability, they can be harder lessons to learn. Yeah, and seems to come back to that every time. And you know, the, mm-hmm. the skill is already there. Like most of the time, the skill is already there. We don't draft people that suck. You know what I mean? Like, there's, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a reason you have a, a jersey on, and most people look at me as like, "Well, what am I gonna do?" I'm just gonna listen and pay attention to the shit that's around you. And when something goes wrong, like fuck, like understand. What could I have done better? Instead of pointing at, at, at uh, well, sometimes it's somebody else's fault. But you know what? You are the one that looks in and says, what could I have done? Most of the time, it, it creates a better overall human being and a better overall employee of whatever the fuck you're doing. <laughs> so mm-hmm. It's good advice. I like it. I appreciate that. I could have used that advice when I was younger. Where were you? Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. hey, you know what? You and me I'm both just saying. Oh, yeah. I, unfortunately, I learned that a little bit late. So here I am. But now, yeah, me too. Here we are talking about it and teaching it to people that eventually <laughs> use it. And maybe somebody will listen. You never. Hopefully, know. somebody will listen. God, I hope. So. I cross my fingers every day <laughs> that somebody will listen. So was the Tommy John surgery like the downfall of what happened or was that just like an added? I was pretty beat up. I threw a lot. So I mean, yeah, I could, I could say that was, uh, I, I worked my ass off to get where I was. So um, yeah, at the end of the day, the surgeries were probably what ended my career. I had plenty of time. I, I, I played for 10 years. I threw a lot. So yeah, at the end of the day, I was, my my arm probably was not as good as it, it needed to be so it's hard to say that injuries ended your career because i don't want to i don't want to blame it on that but at the end of the day yeah um i wasn't i was not capable of competing at the level that i knew i should i needed to be able to in order to because i had an offer to play in japan for for a decent amount of money and i had to call them like look my i'm not gonna be able to contribute so i'm done so I just went on to coaching career instead because at some point you look at yourself in the mirror and like, am I really good enough to do this? I know, I know I can't do it anymore. So why am I going to waste somebody else's time when there's somebody else who can do it better than I've done? So probably a hard combo though, to have with yourself to say like, I'm done. You, you know, have, I can't do this anymore. You mm. have no idea. It was a difficult, difficult time. Cause I had offers if they come, come play for us. Come play for us. That's, I'm not, I'm not good enough to do it anymore. Sorry guys. Somebody else is going to be better than me. So let somebody else that is more worth your while. I'm not going to steal somebody else's money. You know? I was going to say that it takes like a really good person to do that. Or even like the self-realization because most people would just be like, hell yeah, I'll just write it out. Even if I can't really do what I'm supposed to do, I'll take your money. No, most no. people would do that. So it takes You're a not- really good person to be like, no, I know well, I'm done. When you've competed at the highest level and you're like, okay, I can't do it. Be honest with you. That's part of it. Yeah, okay. There's, there's, there's nothing more defeating than going out there and getting destroyed when you know that you're not good enough. So it's mm-hmm. like, hey, listen, just let, let the kids play kind of thing. Like not, not let the kids play because I'm, I was, it's not like I was old, you know, when I, when I <laughs> had, it's like, I'm still, I still wake up every morning and think, hey, I can do this everybody does that ever had a competitive spirit in their life. You know, I, I still think mm-hmm. every single day, I think I wake up and like, God damn, I feel great. I, I can do this today. And then you're reminded by, you know, limitations that you can't. So you just have to be honest. I can't be paid six figures to, 
to be terrible at what I do. You know, I'm never going to do that. <laughs> yeah. I was just curious. Cause you know, you see people like Kopech, you know, the white Sox picked up Kopech and he ended up having to get Tommy John right at the beginning of his career, but it was also at the beginning, but he was able to come back, but you know, well, yeah, he's, well, he's very young. He's got a very, very bright future. I've had the privilege of coaching him. And that's um, so awesome. Yes. He, he is not just, he's barely started and he's going to be great. Not just great. I think he's going to be incredible like that. He's one of the best talents I've ever seen in my life. So can you tell our listeners a little bit what is Tommy John's surgery? Uh, it's tough. So it's so Tommy John surgery. It's it's uh, you have a torn UCL, which is an ulnar collateral ligament. I can show you my scar here. This is, oh, yeah. OK. So it's like right at your elbow. Right. So it's, it's the main ligament that holds your joint together at the elbow. It's reconstructive surgery. If you rip it, there's no starting and stopping point to where your elbow and forearm flex and extend, right? So when that goes, you're debilitated to an extent where you can't fun- you cannot function. Mm-hmm. It sucks. So you try to throw the ball. Essentially, it feels like somebody's stabbing you with a with a kettle prop. Who hikes? That's not yeah, so as soon as it, as soon as it tears. Yeah. So that's what you, that's what you go through. So what they do is they open that up and they reconstruct the entire elbow from the ground up. And wow. you have to basically relearn to do everything over a year and a half. So when I got that surgery, I couldn't even peel a banana. It, wow. was, it was very difficult. You're in a, you're in a cast for three months. Then you, you relearn how to basically grip you. You have to lift a one pound weight for a month. You have to lift a two pound weight for a month. It it takes a, a, it's a full year and a half recovery. It sucks. And you go through a pretty dark place at that point in time. And (laughs) uh, about a year later, you're able to throw. So what these guys are able to go through is a little past just, hey, I'm going to go through surgery and, and start start throwing again no it's uh you almost have to relearn what you do it's, it's like relearn how to walk with your arm wow you can't do shit for at least six months and then once you start doing it if, if you feel like you have two left hands if you're right-handed it sucks so it's a myth that you can throw better after because there was always well, that myth for well, the longest yes. time <laughs> most, most of that is because guys get a lot stronger in their shoulder right so hmm, you get uh, a lot stronger in their shoulder and, and you're uh accelerators, everything else, you're structurally a lot more sound in your bigger joints. The, the elbow had nothing to do with it. Well, because it's, it's still muscle memory at the, at the end of the day. It's just you're, you're more stable. So at, after a year and a half of, of strengthening of, of things that you prob- or were probably the original issue, yeah, okay, I'm able to throw, strong, like, you know, throw a little bit harder, but Yes, on average, it is actually a myth that you throw harder. It's probably throw a mile an hour across the board, a mile an hour slower. Yeah. I always wondered. <laughs> most, yeah, most people are very, very wrong about that assumption. I thought so. Yeah, it's not, it's not easy. <laughs> so now <laughs> we're getting the truth. <laughs> and you weren't really showing us your scar. You just wanted to flex for us. That's all it was. Yeah, no, it was. No, <laughs> no, we saw no, right no, through no, that. No. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> and that's why he's drinking his wine now. <laughs> so, what was the hardest thing you had to un- overcome and why? Oh, gosh. I think we're pretty sure we just covered that. That, uh, yeah. That was, that was by far the hardest thing I ever had to overcome. That was was there anything else that's non sports related that was like the hardest thing to overcome? How about that? Oof, that's a good question. Um, mm-hmm. I can throw some good ones. When I was in the major leagues, it was always like, hey, uh, can I get tickets? Can I do this? Can I have this? Oh, can, give I me that. Yeah, so it's like, All you're doing is you're asking stuff of yeah, me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dealing, dealing with everything. But you're not well. really and, being a friend or family. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and answering to people that you never fucking knew in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. That want something. Yeah. Having people want so much from you, but they're really not there for you as an actual. Wait a minute. Yeah. 
I think that that was that was a little bit of a hurdle, and uh, and then understanding at the end of the day, once you're not in the spotlight, as soon as you're not looking around, like, oh, okay, where is everybody? You know? Oh God, yeah, that's rough. I could see that yeah. being real rough. And, and the thing is, it wasn't though, because the right people were always still there. A lot of your relationships it actually strengthens, but then you become a, more aware of the people that, like, holy shit, this is what life is like, right? Like, <laughs> people are like, God damn, like people really want something for nothing. Yep. Yeah. But you weeded out the ones who didn't matter, basically. Well, yeah, at the end of the day, it's why you try to give to like as many people as you possibly fucking can because everybody's trying as hard as they can, right? So, mm-hmm. being like, God damn, like, good. Dealing with people that are not genuine was very difficult. Everybody, everybody does. Everybody does. Mm-hmm. Goddamn yeah, you just you just had a lot more of them because more people knew who you were, so they were for like, a hey. time, yeah. for a little bit of time, I did. So is this a bad time to ask for tickets? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, at this point, I don't even know if I can get tickets. You want to come to a Canapolis game? Come on out, babe. Yeah, sure. Me and Rietta, next time Rietta's in town, we'll go. <laughs> Honestly, those games are awesome anyway. Because We used to go to uh, the Windy City Bolts, and uh, it was a blast. My son had a blast. Like we, It was so much fun. Well, honestly, shit, my wife would love some company at these games, so come on out. I'd love, I'd love to have you guys. Next time I'm home, absolutely. Heck yeah. I love me some baseball, so I would be there anytime. I honestly go for the food. Not going to lie. Rock solid food here, too. The food and the beer. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so the last fun question besides me just being a goofball. If you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Uh, You know what? I've read these questions forever and I was trying to figure this out. I wasn't sure. I want to say I would stop time. Okay, I would either fly, which which is one, yeah, um, or I would stop time. I think I would stop time so I could uh, enjoy more moments more often. Oh, okay. I like that. I don't get enough time with my wife, and I, I, I would love to stop time. So you guys got to meet Kelly. Kelly, you have to meet these guys. It's my wife, Kelly. Hi, <laughs> hi, Kelly. <laughs> How are you guys? It's really good. good. Cheers. 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 I, you know, I feel like I'm doing this whole podcasting thing wrong now that I saw him oh, slide. Yeah. It no, never no, no, occurred no. to me. <laughs> like next time. I love it. Love it. Uh, you guys are awesome. How to deal when shit gets real. I am Connie. Check us out on all of our social medias. Thank you, John, so much for being on our podcast today. And uh, new episodes every Friday. Don't forget to rate and review. Cheers.